Okay, so last time we were talking about uh, processes, uh, scheduling and threads. So just as a recap, we uh, talked about several different uh, uh, scheduling policies that are used in operating systems. Today we will look at how some of those policies change when you have multi-processors. Okay? And then I also spoke about uh, threading packages, user level threads, kernel level threads, lightweight processes and so on. Okay. Uh, now from a programming standpoint, it just should not matter whether your threading package is user level or kernel level. Typically thread packages have APIs, you just write your code using those APIs and you don't, you as the application programmer usually don't care whether the underlying thread package is designed using uh, user level threads or kernel level threads. Okay. So it should be somewhat transparent to you. There are two uh, very popular thread packages and very likely uh, if you use threading in your programming assignment which you likely will you may end up using one of these two okay? you may also use something else if you pick a different language so in C and C++ you have something called POSIX threads or P threads okay? it's a POSIX is a standard and it specifies an API uh, which allows you to create threads, manage threads, and do use synchronization and so on. Okay. So uh, once you write your code in C or C++ using POSIX threads, all you really need to do, it, it is platform independent because any platform that supports POSIX threads, whether it's Windows, Macs, or Linux, your code should run the same way. Okay. So uh, once you write it to the P threads interface, you just have to recompile it to a new platform and then your code should run. So it's meant to be cross platform as a standard and it is quite popular uh, when you have C or C++ application. If you have Java applications or Java code, you can use Java threads. Threads are built into the uh, Java language. Okay. In C or C++, it's not a language feature. It's just a library that you use in your application. In Java, threading is supported natively. Okay, it's built into the uh, Java threads. Again, Java, by because Java is itself cross-platform. Once you write your Java application, okay, so long as you have a JVM on a platform, it should run, should be able to take advantage of uh, uh, the thread. So your interfaces to access threads doesn't change. Okay? And uh, the point I was making is, uh, the, neither the POSIX threads standard nor Java threads actually specify whether to use user level or kernel level threads. Okay? That is left to the implementation. Whoever is writing the pthreads library or the JVM has to decide how to use or implement threads. Okay? The interface that is exposed to the application programmer is unchanged. That's what is specified by the Java language or the pthreads API. Yes, John. Um, so if you're like, let's say you're using Java threads and you don't have access to the kernel level, um, like let's say you want to write like a multi-processing type of application, would you need kernel level, kernel level access? Okay, so question is if you write a threads uh, uh, application and you wanted to use the, or not use but exploit the presence of multiple processors, would you not need kernel level? So you are right in that if you write your multi-threaded application and want to make specific use of multiple cores, you need kernel level thread support. Okay, uh, But when you write your threaded application, you are trying to think about how your application part divides itself into threads. Whether the threads actually run in parallel or are simply scheduled one after another shouldn't actually uh, change how you write the application. Your application will just run in actually run you know, in parallel if you run it on a multi-core system. Okay? So the flip side of it, if you want to use multiple cores, typically any platform that runs on multiple cores would have kernel level thread support. Otherwise, so you can't use the cores in the same application. You will have to have independent processes run on different uh, cores, for instance. Okay. Any other questions here? Okay, so you will probably encounter either one of these libraries or several others uh, depending on what language you use but keep that in mind i mean as up to application designer it shouldn't matter whether it's user level or kernel level right? as a system designer it should matter because you are going to be the one writing the libraries or the jvms for the people who write the application okay so that's where basically where what it comes down to 
so we will continue that discussion and generalize it uh, what we are going to do for the rest of the class is multi processor scheduling and distributed scheduling okay, we have talked about uniprocessor cpu scheduling algorithms last time okay, we will continue that and uh, discuss multi processor scheduling so here's the picture to keep in mind this is referred to as a standard shared multi memory multi processor so what you have uh, in the picture the circle the blue circles represent processors or cores okay each core has multiple levels of caches on it okay which uh, we will talk about why that matters so there's the l1 cache which may be uh, on the processor itself there may be an l2 cache okay? which and then there may be even an l3 cache some may be dedicated to cores or some may be shared okay but there are caches that's the important part and caches are used to speed up the execution of instructions okay? typically uh, when you have a cpu you have a cache because it can store instructions or data that have been fetched from main memory okay and then if you basically are in a loop and you are executing that instruction again you don't have to get fetch it from the memory it's already in the cache or if you are accessing some variable that memory location is also in the cache okay? so caches are used to speed up okay? there are performance optimization that are used to speed up the execution of the program and we'll see why that matters from a scheduling perspective okay so we will basically assume that you have this picture in mind okay so the bottom part is the main memory that's the bank of ram and there's a shared bus typically any processor has to access uh, some location in main memory it will do so via the shared bus okay the shared bus is an interconnect that will arbitrate access there will be multiple processors trying to access multiple memory banks so it has to do the arbitration okay, that's a very basic architectural details that you need to know for multi processor scheduling okay now conceptually here are two different techniques for implementing multi processor uh, cpu scheduling we talked about uni processor cpu scheduling here is what happens in a multi processor scheduling the simplest technique is shown on the top this is referred to as a centralized run uh, uh, ready queue last time i told said that you have a ready queue which is a queue of all the processes that are ready to execute so when the cpu scheduler runs it takes a process from the ready queue and it schedules it for execution okay this is a simple generalization of the same idea there is a centralized ready queue for the entire system any process that is ready to run will actually be queued up here okay and then there are these processors so whenever a time slice on a processor expires the cpu scheduler will run the kernel will execute the cpu scheduler on that processor then that cpu scheduler on that processor that's running on that processor will examine the ready queue and pick a task or a job or a process or whatever you want to call it from the queue and schedule it for execution okay and if the another time slice on another processor ex expires the same thing will happen okay so that's basically the the notion of having a centralized ready queue and we'll talk about what are the pros and cons of doing this in just a moment okay here is an alternate approach okay you have a ready queue per core or per processor or for smaller group so this is a distributed queue model okay in the limit you have one ready queue per core or one per processor okay so when the time slice on that processor expires the cpu scheduler runs and it only looks at its local queue and just picks a task from that okay and then it will use whatever scheduling policy it has on that ready queue okay so there are these two uh, approaches either use a centralized ready queue or a distributed ready queue so so you may say what does it matter does it actually impact anything in terms of how the cpu scheduler works or what uh, the jobs actually see okay so we'll look at now advantages and disadvantages okay so the first uh, let's go back to the centralized queue okay yeah, so i basically the uh, claim is when you have centralized data structures such as a centralized queue as the number of processor grows this queue is going to be a bottleneck from the cpu scheduling perspective okay why it will take a lot okay yes so basically queue is a shared data structure If the time slice on processor one expires and the cpu scheduler is trying to pull a job from the queue okay it has to first lock the queue okay so that no other cpu scheduler because cpu time slices may expire concurrently 
Okay, so CPU schedulers on each of those processors will run. Okay, and then they'll try to take a uh, job from the queue. So right? you have to lock the structure. Okay? Now the more the number of processors, more likely is it that the time slices may expire more or less at the same time. Okay, and more likely is it that if one uh, processor holds a lock on the queue, another CPU scheduler will wait. Okay, the CPU scheduling uh, running on the other processor will wait. That will waste time on that core. Okay, because it is not able to grab a lock, so hence it is not able to pull a job from the queue, hence it is not able to execute it and the CPU scheduler is simply waiting and wasting cycles. Okay, so you will basically see uh, uh, as the queue becomes a bottleneck, the utilization of the processor may drop because the CPU scheduler is wasting more and more time trying to simply wait for the lock. Okay. So that's a disadvantage of this approach. Okay. And that disadvantage, as you can imagine, goes away as you have distributed queue. The limit where you have a local queue for each CPU scheduler, or rather each processor, you don't have to lock because it's your queue. Okay. No other processor is going to come and try to grab jobs from that. Okay. So it is much more efficient. And you, you probably should lock it anyway because new tasks may arrive. Somebody may put a task, but there will not be lock contention. To the extent you see in a centralized queue. Okay, so, so the locking problem is much less or almost eliminated in the distributed model. Okay, so that's one advantage and what's a disadvantage becomes an advantage. Now uh, there is another advantage, a disadvantage of the centralized queue. And that disadvantage basically says is that when there are jobs in this ready queue, okay, they may get assigned to any processor. You don't control that. Whenever a job, uh, a time slice on a processor becomes idle, okay, the CPU schedule run and it pulls a job. Okay, so if, the, if a particular process ran on the fourth core, next time it may get to run on the first core. So it will just keep hopping between cores or processors. Whichever one becomes idle, it will get assigned there. Okay, and the claim is if you just keep moving cores or processors, that is inefficient for the job it will impact the performance. Why do you think that's the case? Caching. Yes, caching is a problem because remember what I said here, we'll go back to the picture in the previous slide, caches are local to a core. Okay? If a job ran, a lot of its instructions and data are already cached in the L1 cache or L2 cache, which are not shared caches, they are dedicated caches. Next time if it runs on a different core, it will start with a cold cache. The first uh, several instructions or hundreds or thousands of instructions will be all cache misses. Okay, you will have to fetch all of those instructions back from main memory, which slows down the execution. Okay, every time you start with a cold cache, you will see cache misses. Cache misses slow down performance. Okay. Yes. So, so would you need to clear the cache and fill it again every time you switch cores? Or? So the question is, do you clear the cache when you switch cores? So if you simply switch cores, you just let those those instructions will get evicted by other new data or instruction that are fetched in by other processors. You don't need to clear it. They will just get cached out. Okay, so you don't need to worry about that. But what you do need to worry about is if you start with the cold cache, you're taking a performance hit. Okay, so centralized <coughs> use allow you to, uh, not allow, rather impact the performance of a process of a process whenever it switches course. And that's very likely because you don't control as a global queue. Okay, you are simply assigning jobs to processors as the processor time slice expires. Okay, so your jobs are very likely to keep switching cores and every time you do that you are going to have a performance hit. Okay. Now you will see that that disadvantage will not be present if you have a purely distributed single queue per processor model because you are basically in the queue that is assigned directly to one processor so you will continue to execute on that core of processor. So you will the previously cached data may still be likely be present the next time you run. Some of that may be cached out by other processes that ran in the meanwhile since you ran large, but by and large the data will be there. So you will start with a warm cache as opposed to a cold cache. Okay, so you will not see that performance hit. Okay. So so the distributed cache has eliminated some of these disadvantages. Okay, so you may ask, so is, should we just write a distributed queue when you have multiprocessor scheduling? Because I explained that centralized queues have two limitations. Okay, do you have any thoughts on 
are there prob issues with the distributed queue or the disadvantages processor could be idle okay any other things so the main issue with a distributed queue is uh, distributed queue model is that they, the queues may have different number of jobs. So the cores may be loaded to different extents. Okay? There may be 10 jobs queued up in on core 1's queue and only 2 in core 2. So the 2 that are on core 2 will get a lot more CPU time than the 10 jobs may get one tenth of a core each. The 2 jobs that are on core 2 may get half the core. So if you see load imbalances between queues, which are some queues are longer than other queues, then not all jobs in your system will get a fair share of the CPU time. It will depend arbitrarily on what queue you got assigned on how many other jobs are in the queue. In a centralized queuing model, this problem doesn't occur because there's only one queue. Everybody has a shot. It's the same uh, fair shot at getting CPU time. Okay, so this is a standard problem whenever you have multiple queues, okay, even in real life. So if you think about if you go to buy a ticket or some such thing, if there are multiple lines, you always see that somebody else's line is moving faster okay, and you feel like you are waiting longer and okay, you don't feel fair. But on the other hand, if there is one long queue and then the same, uh, you basically go to the next available teller or counter, it always seems to be more fair because okay, the line moves at the same rate. Okay, same is true here. Yeah, so the queue here you may have imbalance or some queue may actually become shorter or may start processing jobs faster because of shorter jobs or whatever. And then you may even have the limiting case that was just mentioned which is some queue may be completely empty but other queues are full. So the cores are sort of idle but other cores are all overloaded. Okay, So to ad address this you have to periodically do load balancing between. Every once in a while you need to go and say what is the number of jobs in each queue and rebalance so that there are approximately the same number of jobs. Okay, so you have to do this extra work on top of the CPU scheduling, just scheduling that queue. Okay, so that increases the amount of effort you spend in doing the CPU scheduling because that's the only way to get around that disadvantage. Okay. So those are the pros and cons. And now there is no one answer. You can pick uh, whichever one you want. If you have lots of lots and lots of cores, then clearly that's the bottleneck. So you don't want to go down uh, the path of implementing centralized queues. But if you have a two core system, a single centralized queue may be okay. If you have 16 core, 32 core, that's probably going to start becoming a bottleneck. Then you want to go down the path of having more than one queue. You don't need to have exactly one queue per core, but you can share a num small number of cores if you want to. Okay, but they may still hop between cores and have caching effects and so on. Okay, so those are the two approaches. And what you use actually depends on how many cores you have in the system of processors. Can we have like shared cache for this post? Okay, question is can we have shared cache? That's really dependent on the hardware, right? So typically what happens is uh, L1 cache is on the core, it's on the chip, so you can't share it. L2 caches or L3 caches may be external to the chip. So the, point, the limit, practical limitation of whether you can share or not is whether the cache is inside a chip or outside a chip. Memory banks are outside so you can have multiple uh, cores access them. If the cache is on the chip, you cannot share it with another uh, core. Right? By chip, I mean on the core. Right? So, uh, so some caches like L1 caches are almost never shared. They are actually built onto the core itself. They are very close to the core for highest performance and most efficiency. Other caches may be shared, in which case some of those effects are mitigated, but really that's up to the hardware design. Okay, when you write your OS, you may not know what, what kinds of processors it will run on. Right? So you have to ensure that it will still get good performance despite some of the caches not getting shared. And then if you write the only centralized model, you will have that. Okay, any other questions here? Okay, so uh, so one other uh, thing you can do about the centralized queue is this notion of cache affinity. Yeah, so cache affinity basically says that if you have scheduled a process onto a core or a processor previously, it has an affinity to that core because it has actually data and instructions on that uh, in its cache. 
Okay, so you can use a heuristic called cache affinity. Even though you may have a centralized queue, okay, when a processor becomes idle, the CPU scheduler tries to look for a process that is in the queue that has an affinity which has previously run. Rather than picking the one at the front, you look saying, did it actually run previously? If it ran somewhere else, let's go down and look at other jobs that are queued up. Okay. So if you ensure this cache affinity, you can still get around this problem. But clearly now the policy is no longer fair in that you are skipping over jobs that are in the front of the queue and giving uh, access to other jobs to this. But you could do that. Okay? You can have this notion of cache affinity built in because that's very important from performance standpoint. Okay? If you just simply keep moving them across cores, then you lose this affinity. Yes. Yeah. So like, like in the same way that it can choose like which core goes next with the threat, like can it also do that with with uh, lock contention? Like such that it chooses which one gets the next lock, so that. Yeah. So lock. So question is, can you also ensure fairness for lock contention? So you can use whatever policy you want to assign the lock to a uh, to a CPU. But the problem with lock contention is not that you are being unfair. It is simply that others are being made to wait until one processor has pulled a job from the queue. Okay. So you cannot fundamentally prevent that waiting. If the lock is in use, everyone else has to wait. Okay, that's basically the way locks work. So it's not a question of should you assign them in order. You could still have done that, but then if others are ready to pull jobs and there is lock, there is a lock on the queue. You cannot do it. You have to wait. Okay. So cache exploiting cache affinity for multiprocessor scheduling is a key uh, efficiency criteria to keep in mind. If you don't exploit cache affinity, your uh, uh, performance will really go down because there are many ca caches that are not shared and if you basically start with cold caches you will have performance degradation so that's an important aspect to keep in mind when you are distributed queue cache affinity is automatic because you are always assigning the right job to the right core in centralized queues this policy has to explicitly make sure that cache affinity is respected otherwise your performance will not uh, be great okay so I'm going to switch gears a little bit. We should talk about multiprocessor scheduling, but we'll talk about parallel applications and see uh, what you can do to uh, increase the efficiency of parallel application. Okay, so here, the scenario is you have, let's say, a multiprocessor system, eight cores, 16 cores, doesn't matter, some number of cores or processors. Okay? And then these cores are often used for what are referred to as a parallel applications. These applications have components that run on more than one core. Okay? In the limit, parallel applications can also run across machines. Okay? But for now, let's just take the scenario where you are just running multiple applications. So there are uh, specialized scheduling policies called gang scheduling or co-scheduling that try to coordinate how jobs are assigned across cores or processors. Okay? Let's say you have a job with n threads and then there are n cores. Such a policy would allocate all n threads onto the n cores at once so that the all threads are running at the same time. They can exchange messages or do whatever and make progress. Okay. For certain parallel applications, coordinated scheduling of all the parallel components of the application all at once improves performance because there's a lot of communication or message passing. So if you send a message and the other side does not respond, you have to block. Okay. If the other side is also running and can process the message and send back a response, you can make faster progress. Okay, so to prevent blocking effects and so on, uh, this gang scheduling or post scheduling policies are used for scheduling parallel applications. All that these do is they coordinate. Your application has multiple components, you run them in parallel all at once. Okay, in the previous case, we assumed that each core makes its own decision independent of what's happening on other cores. In this case, think of it as a CPU scheduler looks across all the cores and schedules them all at once and preferably using components of the same application. Okay, so this is how parallel applications are actually implemented uh, in terms of scheduling them. Okay, and uh, uh, there are several issues that come up which I won't go into a lot of detail but we'll just mention. Okay. One is what happens when one component of the application blocks. So let's say you scheduled n threads on n cores. One of them blocked because it did I/O or it did synchronization. The other n minus one are still running. 
But if your goal is all of them have to be running, and if some of them are just blocked, what do you do? Okay? Then you can basically preempt them all, okay, which is all or nothing. If one of them blocks, you say that some components are non, can no longer run, so everybody has to remove it. Okay? Or you essentially prevent preemption by saying that I will not do that, but I will basically uh, use spin lock so it doesn't actually give up the CPU, it just does busy wait. Okay. This is going to waste cycles because when you block, typically you are sent off to the wait queue to wait. Okay, But if you can do busy wait, then you will continue to execute so your whole application doesn't have to be uh, context switched out. Okay, so there are variants of this policy. I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just trying to explain what are things you have to worry about. Okay, so if you schedule N and one of them blocks, should you can either preempt them or the one that blocked, you don't preempt it, but you make it busy where it's still executing. Okay, it's just sitting in a loop waiting for something to happen. Okay, this, this is referred to as a spin lock. The other thing you could of course do is provide some flexibility to the application designer on how they want to schedule their jobs. Rather than the CPU scheduler scheduling it for certain parallel applications, uh, if they are carefully designed, you will allow, even allow the application designer to say, these groups should be scheduled at once. These other groups can be scheduled arbitrarily, things like that. And it depends on the application of what policies you pick. But there are certain schedulers that even allow control all the way to the dis application design for very fine grain control to sort of figure out how the performance is going to be when you execute. And the application is a single process we are talking about, like the n threads of the single process we are scheduling at once. Yes, so in the, if it's on if the parallel application is running on one machine, you have n threads, but parallel applications are, don't have to be necessarily multi-threaded, they could also be multi-process. Just assume that there are n components, whether they are n threads or n processes should not be important as such. Point is that n components work together to implement their parallel application. So the question is, can you schedule them all at once so they all make progress and they all communicate without blocking and things like that. Okay. Any other questions here? Okay. So, Distributed scheduling is the next uh, important topic and this is uh, somewhat interesting and important uh, uh, generalization of multiprocess. So we started with uniprocessor one core. We talked about multiprocessors, multiple processors or cores on the same machine. Now we are going to look at independent machines and think about what can you do for scheduling tasks that run on independent machines. Okay, is the progression clear? We went from single core to multiple cores on the same machine, now we are looking at n machines themselves. Okay. So here is the assumptions that we will keep in mind. So we will assume there is a distributed system. Okay. There are n workstations, there are n machines roughly. Okay. They are all connected on a local area network. Okay. And uh, typically what would happen is the workstations do uh, their uh, scheduling independently. A, a, a kernel runs. Okay. You basically just as let's say you have your laptop, you start applications, your kernel is simply scheduling them. It doesn't coordinate anything with other machines on the network. It does its own thing. Okay? That's the base assumption that you have a regular uniprocessor or multiprocessor CPU scheduler that's running on that workstation and it does whatever it does locally without talking to others. And now the question is, can you get any benefit if the CPU scheduler on machine one somehow coordinates with CPU schedulers on other machines and if so, what are the benefits? When do you get these benefits and how should you do the scheduling? Okay, so distributed scheduling basically says let's look globally across all the machines and decide how the job should be scheduled. That requires coordination. You could have said I will not do distributed scheduling, I am simply going to do local scheduling on each machine. Yeah, machines just do their own thing and don't actually coordinate CPU scheduling across machines. So we'll first ask the question, does it actually help? If it doesn't help, why do it? Just stick to your regular model of do local scheduling, don't coordinate. Yeah, so this all this discussion is going to be under what scenario does distributed scheduling matter or help? Okay, to answer that question, you have to answer this somewhat more abstract question which is, what is the probability that there is at least one system idle 
and one job waiting. I'll explain what that is, means in a moment. Okay, so first let's even think about what distributed scheduling could do for us. Okay, so here is a, a small example. Let's say there are three machines and there is a queue, a ready queue on each machine. So now the question is to so typically and there's a CPU scheduler here. Okay. If you just did local scheduling, these jobs would just simply run on the schedule. Okay. If you do distributed scheduling, there is a chance that a job that is sitting in a queue of machine I will be transferred to machine J and get scheduled there. That is what coordination will do for you. The ability to execute a job on any machine in the system. Just as in multiprocessor scheduling, you could execute a job on any processor. Here now we allow a job that's been submitted okay, to be executed on any machine, not just the machine it was submitted to. Okay, so what that means is you start up an application on your machine, the distributed scheduler has the ability to actually run it somewhere else okay, and make it look like it's still executing. Okay. Question is, you know, clearly this will add complexity because you are now coordinating between machines. The question is, does it actually help? you to take a job from one ready queue, move it elsewhere and execute it elsewhere. Okay. And you can think of some scenarios where it might help. So for instance, if there are many jobs queued up on machine I, but machine J is completely idle. There is nothing executing here. But machine I, one machine is overloaded, another machine is idle. Probably makes sense to move some work from the overloaded machine to the idle machine. Okay. That way you are making better use of your resources. Okay, so that's the kind of scenario where we want to sort of exploit when we do distributed scheduling. Okay. But then the question really is, is that a common case? Okay, will you ever actually, is it, is it relatively common where you are going to get these scenarios where you can make use of distributed scheduling and so on? Okay. And that is what leads us to this question of, is there basically, what is the probability that there is at least one system that's idling and then there's at least another system that has one job, one job is executing and another job is waiting, which means that it has more load than the other system. So you could move it. Okay. So the answer to that question is this curve here. But before I explain that, let me just uh, give you the intuition. Okay, now when, so let us take the scenario where uh, the system as a whole is lightly loaded. Okay, so rather than asking the question that way, we'll ask the question some other way. Let's take some scenarios. Let's say system is lightly loaded, low utilization scenario. Okay, so it said, will distributed scheduling help or not? Okay. So if you are lightly loaded, what are the chances that there are some machines idling? The system as a whole is lightly loaded. Yes, if the system is slightly loaded, there is very high probability that some machines are actually idle doing nothing. Okay. So these machines are potential candidate for receiving work from other machines. Okay. But then the question is, since the system as a whole is lightly loaded, what is the probability that there are machines that are that have jobs waiting that can be actually sent to these idle machines? very low right? because system as a whole is lightly loaded so uh, the probability that any one machine is overloaded is actually going to be very little. Okay? So what does that tell you? If you put these two things together, what does it tell you about distribute benefits of distributed scheduling? Okay, so it should say there isn't any benefit. There are machines ready to accept work, but there is no machine that has enough work to send to those machines. Okay? So if you implement a distributed scheduling you will get very little benefit in the lightly loaded case because there isn't much to do. Okay, there are machines that are willing to have take on work, but there are no machines that have any work to send them. So the distributed scheduler will just sit there doing nothing okay, because there isn't anything to do at all. Let's take the other scenario. Let's take the scenario where system is heavily loaded. Okay, so we looked at the lightly loaded case, now we look at the heavy utilization case. So system is heavily loaded overall, okay, that's the average load and the system is high. Okay. What is the probability that there are machines that are high in such a scenario? No problem. 
Okay, so there is the problem if the system as a whole is heavily loaded, the probability that any one machine is sitting idle is going to be low. Okay. Now, what is the probability that there are machines that have lots of jobs they are willing to send to other lightly loaded machines? It's high probability because the system is heavily loaded, so most machines have enough work and more work to do. Okay. So, in this case, you have a scenario where there are lots of machines waiting to send jobs to other machines, but there are no machines that are available to send those jobs to because everyone is also heavily loaded. And now you again put those two things together. What does it tell you about distributed scheduling? Okay. So in this case also there is no benefit because you have the opposite case. Okay. Lots of jobs. Most machines are loaded. Okay. But there are no machines waiting to take on any work because they all have work, their own work to do. Okay. So you won't get any benefit of distributed scheduling. So, we shouldn't do it. Lecture is done. Not quite. <laughs> so, we took the two extreme scenarios of light load and heavy load and in neither of those two cases, you do not get benefit. Okay? Now, the only time you actually get benefit is in the middle where you have moderate utilization. Okay? Moderate utilization means you are neither lightly loaded nor heavily loaded. So, there is a moderate chance some machines have uh, uh, light load. As a moderate chance some machines have jobs to send, so you will actually get some benefit. Okay, but you have to be clear that distributed scheduling will get you benefits only in that middle scenario. If you have light load or heavy load, there isn't much you can do because in neither of those two cases, either there is nothing to do or there is something to do but you can't actually do anything about it. Okay. So, so basically high utilization, there is little benefit, low utilization, there is rarely any uh, job waiting. Okay, so yes. No. Yeah, I was just gonna say like it, it probably depends on how many machines you have. Because if you have low utilization, you use less machines, and if you have high, you just expand more machines. Yeah. So right now you're right. We did not change. Uh, actually, talk about what happens if you vary the number of machines. We are simply assuming that the number of machines is fixed, and we are simply observing scenarios under which we'll get benefit. Okay, so coming back to the curve, so 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 we said what is the pro so to get benefit from distributed scheduling, two things have to happen at the same time. There has to be an idle machine. There has to be a machine that has jobs to send to that idle machine. Only if those two things happen at the same time, do you get benefit. If one of those things is false, then you get no benefit. The low utilization case, there are no jobs to send, even though they are machine, so you don't get a benefit. The high utilization case, it was opposite. So the probability that there is at least one system idle and there is one job waiting that probability distribution looks like this. Okay? So this is the utilization on the x-axis, that's the uh, probability on the y-axis. So at low utilization, both of those things do not occur at the same time, only one occurs. At high utilization also the other thing occurs but not the first one. So in both of those cases, the probability of those two things happening at the same time, which is the product, is low. Okay. So that means there is no benefit. Only in the middle where the probability goes up, both of those things are happening often together, goes up, that is where you get the benefit. So that's what this curve is trying to show mathematically. Okay. So, so there is benefits to distributed scheduling, but only in scenarios where you have moderate levels of load in your system. Okay. So that's the thing to keep in mind. In other two cases, just do local scheduling, don't bother. That's what the argument is telling us. Okay, so now we will, having said that, we are actually going to look at distributed scheduling policies. Okay. So there are several design issues on how you build a policy. Okay, we look at a spectrum of those. Okay, the first question is, I said load, how do you measure it? Okay. There are many different metrics. You could say the queue length. Okay, the length of the ready queue is a measure of the load. The longer that ready queue, the higher the load. You could say CPU utilization, okay? number of cycles of, on the CPU that are actually being used per unit time is also a measure of the load. So there are different metrics for load. You, any policy you design has to decide how you are going to measure load to say whether it's high, heavily loaded or lightly loaded. Okay? I will see how specific decisions are. Then you have the type of policy itself. Okay? 
So there are static policies where you hardwired decisions. Typically, uh, that's not what you would use because you don't know what's going to happen in advance. So you can't do a static decision. Okay. So your policy typically will be dynamic. It will lo use load information to decide which machines to actually take jobs and which machines to send it to. Okay. Because that will depend on what is the current load on those machines. Which one is idle, which one is heavily loaded. That will keep changing. And based on that, you will adapt. If next time around this machine gets heavily loaded and this one is lightly loaded, we'll transfer jobs from that one to the other one. Okay, so from who, where do you take the jobs and where you send to is very much load dependent. So your policy has to be dynamic. Okay. The last one is called adaptive, which says the algorithm, the scheduling algorithm that you actually use to make this decision itself will change over time. Okay. In this case, the scheduling algorithm is not going to change. Okay. So where you take the jobs and where you send it depends on the load that will keep changing. But you can have adaptive policy or the policy itself will change. And we'll see examples. Okay, that's just a high level uh, discussion. Okay. Some other issues are should the policies be preemptive or non-preemptive. Okay. So suppose that uh, there are lots, there's an idle machine. Okay, and then many jobs got sent to that machine. But there are other users' jobs. Okay. This is your machine. Okay. You come back to the machine and you start some application. Now your machine is heavily loaded. So you are seeing worse performance because somebody else okay, has sent their jobs to your machine. Okay. Should you be allowed to preempt those jobs and send them back to their original machines? Or are you not allowed to do that? Okay. That's telling you whether it's preemptive or non-preemptive. Okay. Preemptive basically says if a remote job arrives on your system and begin executing, you can actually preempt it and send it somewhere else, either back to the original machine or another idle machine. If you need the machine back, you meaning the user of that machine. Okay. Non-preemptive means once it's sent, you're stuck. Okay. It's going to execute until it finishes. It's not going to move back to some other machine. Okay. That's basically, so it depends on again what you're trying to achieve. Centralized versus decentralized says whether your uh, distributed scheduler runs as one centralized entity that schedules job across all of those machines or is a policy itself distributed is running on each machine and doing, trying to coordinate with other policies running on other machines. Okay. Stability we'll talk about in just a moment. It basically says that you don't want to keep on transferring jobs because you made bad decisions and we'll see that in a moment. Okay. So we'll study these uh, two or three simple policies using four dimensions. Okay, so to design a distributed scheduling algorithm, you have to answer these four questions. Okay. When to transfer a process, okay. which process to transfer, where to transfer it, and then basically uh, what information do you need to make those answer those three questions. Okay, so you are simply asking now, you are allowing jobs to be moved from one machine to another. So you have to ask when should you do it, okay. which job do you want to move. Which machine should you move into? And then what should the distribute, what information does the scheduling policy need to maintain in order to make, answer those questions well? To answer these four things, you have a policy of some sort. Okay. So we'll look at uh, some specific policies. You'll see that there are threshold bases and so on. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. So, so this is the simplest policy you can think of. It's called a sender initiated distributed schedule. Sender initiated scheduler simply says that if a machine becomes overloaded, okay, it actively goes around hunting for other machines to offload some work. So it's, a, it's the sender. Okay, if machine A becomes overloaded, it says I need to send some job somewhere else. It is going to try to find where to send it. And so okay, That's why it's received, referred to as a sender initiated. Okay. So first is the transfer policy. Okay, when should you send some jobs over? The answer is when you become overloaded. What does that mean? Okay, basically, it says that you will keep a threshold of n. Okay? If the size of your ADQ exceeds that value, you are going to say, I need to send some jobs over. I have more jobs than I can handle. You can pick any value of n. It could be 2, it could be 10, it could be 100. Okay, that n says, until the ADQ has, until I have that many concurrent application or processes in my system, I am not going to do anything. Once the number of concurrent processes exceeds that limit, once the size of the queue grows beyond n, then I'm going to try to transfer. So that's basically your transfer policy. 
Okay. So notice that the metric we are using to determine whether you are overloaded is the length of the uh, uh, ready queue, number of jobs in the ready queue. Now we could have used utilization also. Could have put a threshold on the utilization and said every time utilization increases beyond 80%, start sending jobs elsewhere. Could have done that. Okay. But here we are simply saying length of the queue. Now uh, selection policy, once the job has, uh, once the system has become overloaded, which process should you send? There are n to choose from, or not n, but more than n to choose from. Okay, you could pick any of them and send them over. Okay. So here we are going to take a simple uh, uh, idea which says, let us send any newly arrived jobs somewhere else. Okay, if, the, if you just typed in a command, but the job hasn't even started, it's better to start executing it from scratch somewhere else. Okay? If a process has already begun executing, moving it to another machine is a lot more complicated because it's an executing process. It has memory state, it has all sorts of state. To simply move it without doing it right, it is either going to be very hard or something is going to break. Okay? So you would prefer when the system gets overloaded to send any new jobs that are coming in elsewhere because if you start executing them from the beginning elsewhere that is much easier than taking a process and moving it. Okay. Here is the location policy. Location policy says where should you send it. Okay. So basically you want to find a less lightly loaded machine and send it there but the question is how will you find it. Okay. So, so you can basically do random Simplest one, you basically say, I have a job, here is the job, you toss a coin at random, say, let's send it to machine I. Okay. Another policy is you do probing. Okay. You basically send a message to machine saying, what is your load? Okay. The information all comes back and then you pick the least loaded machine and send the job. Okay. So you are basically going to, before you decide which one to send, you probe the machines and then you can get the load information, current load back and you pick the least load. So you can either do that sequentially, okay, meaning you start with machine 1, you say what's your load. Okay. If the load is greater than n, you know that that machine is also a sender. It's also trying to send, so you don't do anything. If so the load is less than n, you say okay, that machine hasn't exceeded its threshold, so it could potentially take on more job. Okay, and then you're done. Okay. So that's sequential. You just find the first machine and send it. Okay, you could also send probes in parallel, you send n messages out uh, to n machines, get back all of the responses and pick the least loaded, okay, the one with the smallest queue, rather than just picking the first one. Okay, so you could basically do it parallel or in sequence, it doesn't, doesn't matter which one you pick, but you will pick one and then you will send it. Okay. So you may think that random is bad because it basically is making a decision without asking for load. But in many cases, it actually works well. Okay. Because if you are in moderate utilization, tossing a coin will actually give you a reasonable performance, not a guarantee. You may end up sending a job to a machine that you picked at random that also has a heavy load. So then it will be forced to send that job somewhere else. So the job will have to hop a couple of times before it lands on a machine that can service it. Okay. Any questions about this sender policy? Okay, so the next policy is the exact opposite, which is receiver initiated. Okay, as the name suggests, in this case, when the machine becomes idle or lightly loaded, it goes around looking for work. It goes around asking other machines to send it work. Okay, that's why it's a receiver of work, so it's a receiver initiated. So it is the policy is initiated by the receiver. Okay, so. When do you say the machine start going looking for work? That is again threshold based. You have a low threshold. If the load on your system falls below the low threshold, you go around looking for work. You could set the low threshold to be zero, which means you have to be actually idle, at which point you go around looking for work. Or you can set it to some small value, saying there are only two or three processes in the system rather than zero, and you still can accommodate other jobs. So whenever the load goes below some threshold T, you become a receiver and you start executing this policy and try to find a process to take on from elsewhere. Okay. And again, the selection policy is which process should you take on. Okay. Like before, you would prefer to take on a newly arrived process. 
a newly arrived project, you basically submitted a job, it hasn't begun yet. Okay. Better to take that job and start set up a new process for it and execute rather than uh, taking something that is, is executing already. Okay. Doing that, the latter requires what is referred to as process migration. It requires you to migrate a process from one machine to another. Okay. It's a complicated task. We'll see a little bit about that uh, next time. So selection policy, always try to do the simplest case, take newly arrived job. Location policy is the same as before. You need to find a machine that's now willing to send you work. Okay, you can toss a coin at, uh, and then randomly contact a machine saying, do you have any work? And if you if your to coin toss lucks out, you'll actually find a machine and it'll send you. The other is you probe them. Right? You can start probing them and say, is the you basically stop at the first machine whose load is higher than a high water mark, a high threshold, and say, okay, you are overloaded, give me a job. Or you can probe n machines in parallel and pick the most heavily loaded machine and try to ask it to send a job to you. Okay, so again, you can do this in sequence or in parallel, or you can do it in random. Okay, this is receiver initiated. Okay, any questions on this? What's the question? Is there user involved activity or is this automatic? Is that your question? Yeah. Okay, so distributed scheduling doesn't re require active user intervention. Users are simply starting processes, running their own application. All that the system is doing is should the application run on your local machine or should it run somewhere else? And that should be transparent to the user. Okay, if you submitted, you started a process here that is actually executing on the mesh for, uh, processor on your machine or somewhere else, it should look the same. Okay, so users typically will not be involved in making this decision. This is done by the C scheduler, the distributed scheduler. So the policy is set? Yes, the policies will automatically make these choices whenever the load goes up or the load is below a threshold. Okay. So question is, uh, is there any difference between the two? Is one better than the other? Sender initiated versus receiver initiated. Is it better to go looking for work or is it better to go looking to give work to someone else? Okay. I think I think receiver initiated is probably a little better. Um, the least utilized nodes will be getting the work. Okay. Receiver initiated is better because less utilized nodes will get work. You have something to say? I don't know if this is an issue, but if the overloaded nodes have to send out work, would it you know inter would it take CPU time away from them finishing the processes that they're already working on to Okay, that's a good point. So point is, if you're already overloaded, you know, you're doing even more work trying to send more work, is that a problem? Right? So it, in some sense, both of these things are true. It turns out that there is no one answer. The receiver initiated or sender initiated is better. It says it depends on the actual load on the system. Okay? If you are towards the lightly loaded case, you're moderate, but on the left side to sort of towards zero, then it is better to be looking for work. So either better to be offloading work. If you are one of the few overloaded nodes in the system, you will quickly find some other machine to take on work and you give it and you are done. Okay? If you are on the other hand looking, you will contact a lot of other idle nodes and say, do you have work? Say no. Do you have work? They will say no, no. And you won't actually do much. Okay? So if you are lightly loaded, it is better to be uh, sender initiated. You find a machine and you offload it. You are done. Okay? If you are heavily loaded, the opposite is true. Yeah, because if you are on, if, if all machines are loaded, if you are trying to offload work, you will contact a lot of other heavily loaded machines and they will say, sorry, I cannot take your work and you will have to do even more work to find those rare underloaded machines. In this case, it is better to be receiver initiated where you can quickly find uh, lots of heavily loaded machines. You can quickly find one and take on work. Okay. 
So the answer is it is actually going to depend on with what the scenario is and uh, not surprisingly you have an adaptive policy that behaves one versus the other depending on the load in the system. Okay, so it combines the two. Okay, so you can basically say if the average load is under some value, average load in the system is under a value, you basically turn on the sender initiated policy because that's more efficient. Okay, you are not going to do wasted work or idle machines contact other idle machines and then say there's nothing to do. Okay? And the same is true when you are more heavily loaded, your system load starts increasing, you turn the policy, switch the policy to be receiver initiated. Okay, because again that's more efficient. You don't have ever overloaded machines talking to other overloaded machines and not finding a machine to give work to. Okay? So this is basically a symmetric policy which says that you don't decide a prior because you can't tell whether what the system is going to run, the load will fluctuate. So we will say that we will basically implement both policies and depending on the actual load we will turn on one or the other because one or the other is going to be more efficient in those two scenarios. This is what I meant by an adaptive policy, the algorithm itself is switched based on the conditions in the system, you have both of them okay? but depending on whether you are below let's say on the lower side of the load uh, overall utilization on the higher side you will actually execute one or the other at that point in time okay is that clear okay so this basically says use both uh, depending on the right scenarios okay so that's basically the higher level concepts of sender initiated receiver initiated when to use both there are three or four case studies of actual systems that have implemented distributed scheduling. Okay? These were the first systems that started implementing this as an idea. Okay? There were two, there was the V system that came out of Stanford. This is all the work done in the late 80s, early 90s, almost 25, 30 years old work at this point. But that's when some of these ideas were first explored in the literature, in the research projects that were being uh, sort of uh, act, that were active at that time. Okay? So V system is was an operating system, a distributed operating system developed at Stanford. It implemented distributed scheduling. Okay, this case study simply says what design decisions did it make. Okay, so information policy says uh, when what information do you actually keep track of to make your decisions. Okay, so here what happened is uh, you had what is referred to as a state change information policy. Whenever significant changes in CPU or memory load were observed on local machine, that machine simply broadcasts its load information to all other machines. Okay. So rather than going around probing what is your load, you simply keep a table saying what do I know about other machines in the system, what is their load. Okay. So we assume that it, the, the table, information in the table is not exact, somewhat approximate because the load keeps changing. So whenever there is any significant change, you go tell everyone, say my load is now 80%. So everybody now has everyone else's load in their table. So if they become a sender or a receiver, they just look at the table and make a decision on what to do. You don't have to go around asking what is the load. Okay. So basically that's the kind of uh, uh, design decision they make. Okay. And then the M more least loaded machines were receivers, the others were senders. And a sender initiated policy was used. Okay. So what you basically, what the way the policy worked is you are a sender and you need to find a job, um, a machine to send. You look at your table okay, and you say what are the M least loaded machines. Okay. Those are the least loaded machines in your system and then what you do is you don't actually just send a uh, job to one of those M. You pick one of those M and you basically query them, are you still a receiver, can you still take my job? Because some other machines may also send the job and it may no longer be a receiver. And you may not have gotten that update, load update from that machine yet. Okay? Because you have somewhat outdated load information, so you, you take the least loaded, that's a reasonable guess that wow, some of those machines are still going to be receivers. You basically probe one of those M and if they are still a receiver, you send the job. Okay. This reduces the amount of search you have to do. Okay. Otherwise, if there are n and n is very large, you may just have to start with one and you have to go to 600 machines before you find a receiver or a send. Here you have some approximate load information. You quickly narrow it down to the uh, possible set of receivers. 
to check are you still a receiver if you are still a receiver no one else has sent you a job you send if you say no i just received some jobs from other machines i cannot take any more you find some other node in that m and you probe yeah, so you can quickly isolate or find your receiver and you are done okay so that's the policy they implemented in the v system it was a sender initiated policy somewhat more, more sophisticated than the very simple one i explained a few slides ago okay. yes um, what if uh, the table has been stored somewhere? No, the table, every machine maintains a load table. That is why load information is broadcast to every node. So every machine has a table that says what is the load on machine I. Okay? Every time an update arrives it for, from some machine J, you will update the entry saying machine J's load has now changed to X percent utilization. So that this table is present on every machine. So you don't have to go to, there is no centralized entity here. Okay, and it's fully distributed. You make local decisions. Okay, so decentralized algorithm. Okay, now the other system is the one from Berkeley that was a sprite operating system. Here you'll see that some design decisions are different. There is a centralized coordinator, exactly what was just asked. This coordinator is the only one that knows about the load on all the machines. So you don't broadcast your load to everyone. There's one centralized coordinator that keeps checking and keeps updating the load and it knows the load on every machine. So it is basically going to have that information and help make decisions. Okay. So the scenario here was that the reason this one uh, had this kind of policy which I'll describe is it was a workstation environment. Okay. This was referred to as a network of workstations. And the idea was workstations in the 80s and 90s were still expensive. They cost 10, 15 thousand dollars, not 100 dollars laptops that you can buy today. Okay, so workstations were expensive. So if you are if you are a user with lots of jobs and then there are some other users with expensive machines that are idle because you are in the class, you have gone for a meeting, you have gone for lunch, the machine is sitting there doing nothing. Why not send some jobs there and make use of those CPU cycles? rather than letting that machine idle because there are not that many machines to begin with. Okay? So they said let's implement a distributed scheduler. Whenever some machines are idle, we will try to make use of those idle cycles. Okay? But the idea was it was workstation environment so you have to basically say owner is king or queen. Okay? Basically that means if the owner is sitting on their machine, you don't want to send jobs to that machine and annoy them. You are basically mouse is not moving because the machine has become overloaded and you are annoyed saying why did I take somebody else's job I will not do it. So to help ensure that you get still see good performance the idea was if you are at your machine only you get to run jobs okay? nobody can send you job but if you are not at your machine people get to send you job. Okay? So you go for lunch your machine is actually being used you come back from lunch the moment you start typing, all those jobs should be preempted. You get your machine back as if nothing has happened. Okay. This seems like a good enough scenario that okay, if you are not going to be impacted, uh, then you are happy to contribute your machine to do other people's work. Okay. So what you don't want is your machine is idle, you lost your job, show up and you come back from lunch and then you can't get any work done because your machine is just crunching away other people's job, you can't even run your browser or mail client. That is not acceptable to a workstation environment. Okay, so, so that's the kind of ideas they had in mind when they designed this policy. Okay, so the policy is as follows. You have a centralized coordinator that keeps track of all the load on the system. Okay, it's a state chain driven policy which means whenever your load changes significantly you tell the coordinator saying my load is X. So the coordinator is assumed to have up to date information. Somewhat up to date information. Okay, and then here is how a machine becomes a receiver. Okay? If there is a workstation with no keyboard or mouse activity for 30 seconds, okay? so basically there is no activity for half a minute and the number of active processes is less than some threshold, okay? which would be number of processors, which means at least one processor is idle, then you become a receiver. Basically, user is not doing anything, there is no mouse, no activity and there is at least one processor idle or some very low load on that processor, you become a receiver. You contact the coordinator saying, I have become a receiver, there is no user, my user is not doing anything on his or her machine. Okay. 
and here is basically the selection policy here it was assumed that you basically manually submit jobs and say run this on any idle machine yeah, so you pick it's not like when you run your browser you say go run the browser on any machine that doesn't make sense that's an interactive application so you run that locally but if you have a simulation to run for your research experiment you say this job can be run anywhere i don't care where you run it run it as fast as possible find idle machines just send me the results okay, so it's a batch job okay, so you say, submit a script the machine can basically the job can run anywhere so the users tell the system like this job can run anywhere by default a job is only run locally because you said you are running interactive application so you have to tell okay, the system once you submit a job that can be run anywhere the workstation will then contact the coordinator saying is there some idle machine assuming the local load is high and you are a sender you look for a receiver and send it so you contact the coordinator the coordinator says here is some other machine no activity for 30 seconds no load send the job there you then send the job so that's basically how it works. Any questions here? Okay. So one thing I did not mention is when the user comes back and finds that there are jobs running, okay. that job has to be moved somewhere else. Okay. That's so, so that is an additional thing that they put into Sprite. To do that, they implemented something called process migration, okay. which was a new thing that hadn't been done in operating systems. So what that says is you have an active process running. I can take that entire process, its memory state, move it somewhere else and it continues to run. Okay, it's not that you kill the job and you restart. You could have said user wants their machine back. This job needs five minutes of CPU time. It is only run for the two minutes. You could kill it and restart, but then you wasted those two minutes of work you've already put into the thing. Okay. So to restart a job somewhere else requires you to move the process as it exists somewhere else. So the entire memory state, the page table, registers, everything moves over. It's a complicated process. It's not trivial to implement process migration. Okay? And furthermore, it can only be done in special scenarios. If you have network sockets open, you move it somewhere else, it doesn't make sense because the network sockets are bound to an IP address. The IP address is unique to that machine. You move the process somewhere else, that has a different IP address. Packets that are still coming to this machine will no longer be delivered to the process. Same is true if you are doing file I.O. If you are accessing a local file on disk, the process gets moved somewhere else and it's not trying to access a file with that name. That is meaningless. That file is on some other machine. Okay? So if you have resources which are uh, file descriptors, network sockets, etc. open, process migration is a lot more complicated. But on the other hand, if it was a purely CPU intensive job, which was just, it had some code, it's just executing and all this data is in memory, you could move the entire memory state and you can continue executing the process somewhere else. That is doable. Okay? Handling open files or communication uh, network sockets, much harder. Can be done. So what, is, what they did in Sprite is they left a, created a forwarding tunnel. So packets would still come to the original machine because you can't break the socket connection, but the machine would actually forward it to wherever the new process is moved to. So it was somewhat transparent. All clunky, but those are the things you have to do. Okay, similarly, file access is you allow remote file access. So you basically say this is a local file and continue to allow access to that file from this other machine through a file server process. Okay, so it basically has to do all of this. Okay, you have to, to state transfer, which is swap everything out, move it somewhere else, load it, or have sockets, deal with them, if there are files, deal with them. So if you implement all of that, you have process migration. Okay? And that's all the work you have to do simply to give the machine back to the user. Okay? It's easy to take on work, much harder to now give that work that you already started to some other machine because it process migration is not trivial. This is why I said when you send a job to some other machine, it's always easier to send a newly arrived job, which hasn't even started executing. You simply start executing it somewhere else, I start set it up as a new process. If you have to move an existing process, you have to do all of this. Okay. But Sprite did do it. Sprite was the uh, OS that implemented process migration for roughly the first time. Okay, there are two more. Uh, case studies for distributed scheduling and then we will stop for today. The third case study is volunteer computing. 
if you have heard of SETI at home or BOINC, okay? anyone heard of these things? Okay, so I'll explain what this is. So volunteer computing basically says, uh, I have a machine and I'm willing to donate some resources from my machine to some com good uh, computational task for a good cause. Let's say, so let's say you are a researcher, you are doing uh, cancer research and you have to analyze a lot of data to, to figure out how to develop a new drug for cancer. Okay? Highly computationally intensive job. Okay? To do this kind of research, you have to be a researcher who has access to lots of machines in order to run your and data analysis. Because okay? so not all researchers necessarily have access to very large clusters. So what some researchers did was said, rather than buying lots of machines which is expensive, let us go and ask random users on the internet say, would you be willing to lend us some cycles on your machine for me to run my job? Okay. If the user says yes, that's basically they volunteered their machine to handle some larger computation. That's referred to as volunteer computing. And the way it works is very straightforward. Okay. You basically download a special screen saver. Okay. Screen saver activates whenever your machine is idle. And that's the definition of a screen saver. So whenever this special screen saver activates, it's not going to show you some fancy graphics on your screen. It's actually a program that contacts the server saying the machine has become idle, send me a small job. Okay? The, the coordinate, the central server will say here, do it. Here's a small piece of data. Here is some code, do some analysis, send back the results. Okay? So you take that code, you analyze the data, you send back the result. The screen saver is still running. Then you say, I need, can you send me the next small chunk? So you send another piece of data, some another piece of code, do more analysis, send back the results. Okay? So you continue in this fashion. When the user comes, the screen saver stops. Okay? Any unfinished job is thrown away. And the server can send it to some other job. Okay? So this is basically how volunteer computing works. Okay? So, so your server has a very large supply of small jobs. Small job may be a small piece of data or a small piece of code to analyze the data. Okay, whenever any screen saver activates and asks for a job, which is clearly a receiver initiated process, okay, you basically send the next job in the queue to that machine. Okay, the machine will do computation and send things back to you. Okay, so you can use this to harness resources of lots and lots of users on the internet. Okay, there are literally people are willing to uh, donate their CPU cycles for a little uh, good cause. Okay, so you know, I participate, I'm volunteering my machine to help with cancer research. Feels good. You know, lots of people uh, relate to these causes, so they are willing to do this. So on the cheap, you have access to hundreds of thousands of machines on the internet. Something that would cost you a lot of money to buy your own cluster to do that computation. Okay, it's a form of distributed scheduling. So this started with this project called SETI at home. Okay, SETI stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. These were a bunch of astronomers who had simply used radio telescopes to gather data to see if there were other intelligent life in the universe. Okay. But doing this meant analyzing a lot of data that basically had nothing. It said there is no real. So they were saying, are there any radio signals we are receiving from outer space that points to sign of intelligent life? So this requires you to scan a lot of data you have collected. Now clearly this was not a funded project. Right? So research uh, funding agencies don't go around funding grants and go look for aliens. Okay? That doesn't seem like the right kind of project. So the way they went about is, so we have data to analyze, but we don't have machines that anybody will let us use uh, or we need to buy such machines. So we'll ask users to donate their cycles. Okay? So they came up with this idea saying, let us give them a screen saver. Whenever the screen saver activates, we'll give them a little bit of data our telescope has gathered. It will analyze it saying, is there anything, is there signal or noise in the data? Most of the time the answer is noise. There's nothing in useful you're seeing and the answer will come back, you send the next piece of data. Okay, so that idea then has evolved into uh, something more general. Now there are lots of projects like this. This is not just astronomers, but clearly drug researchers, cancer researchers all use this. There's a system at Berkeley that was developed called Boink that does the same thing. So I'll show you. Uh, there's a web page for it. So here is the Boink web page. You can go and download. So it's a 
user idle time on Mac, Linux, Android looks like it's cure diseases, global warming, discover pulsars, lots of good stuff. Okay, so you can basically just download a screensaver and join a project and then that server will send you something. You can start your own project. You can say, I am a researcher, I have lots of data, I have no money to buy machines. Can you please uh, approve me as a project so I can use your volunteers' machines to run my uh, computation. Okay. So this is now a coordinated effort. So you will see it has all this, there are 200,000 machines, okay, or rather 400,000 machines that are participating. Okay. So you get a lot of cycles for free. Okay. Other people are donating. Okay. Uh, interesting form of uh, distributed scheduling. Last point, we are out of time, is uh, this system called Condor, which was designed to basically do what Sprite did. Okay. So a group of users within a department come together saying, let's use each other's machines wisely. We implement this thing called Condor, okay, which will do exactly what Sprite did. Okay. When a machine becomes idle, it will go looking for jobs. There's a centralized scheduler where you submit jobs saying run it on any idle machine in the system. Okay. So in the department, we have a cluster called Swarm here, okay, where you can actually submit jobs. That's a cluster. But if you did not have such a server cluster, you could have all the users donating time on their laptop. Okay, you would implement a Condor cluster, implement Condor software. Your machine will contact the scheduler saying send me jobs. Jobs come, you execute, you send that back. So it's a mix between what Sprite did and what uh, SETI at home has done on an internet scale, but within a small group. Okay, 10 users can set up their own Condor cluster, for instance. Okay, so when the user returns to the workstation, you have to give the job. So it is a form of volunteering your resources, but within a group of friends or a small department that can use all the machines better. Okay. So and that has evolved into many other pieces of software that do this form of batch scheduling. SunGrid engine is another one that does the same kind of stuff. You can take a set of machines and schedule jobs on them. Okay, so you'll send jobs to idling machines. So this is all forms of distributed schedulers in today's world. Okay. So with that, I'm going to stop. I think we ran over five minutes, but we finished the lecture. So stop here.